Welcome to episode 291 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent John Morrison, who served in the FBI for 28 years. In this episode, he reviews an eco-terrorism case involving a member of the Animal Liberation Front, also known as ALF, who firebombed the Mink Research Offices and destroyed laboratory facilities at Michigan State University in 1992. According to Wikipedia, ALF is an international, leaderless, decentralized resistance movement that advocates and engages in direct action to protest incidents of animal cruelty. The subject of John Morrison's investigation, Rodney Coronado, was also responsible for the arson and destruction of mink research facilities at Washington State and Oregon State Universities. Coronado pleaded guilty for the Michigan State University crimes, the first federal conviction of an admitted ALF member. John's first bureau assignment was to the Buffalo Division, where he worked counterintelligence and criminal matters and spent one year undercover on a counterintelligence case. The FBI then transferred John to the Detroit Division at the Lansing Resident Agency, where he worked on the ALF investigation. He later requested a transfer to the Chicago Division, where he created the first multi-agency healthcare fraud task force. John was handpicked for a two-year temporary duty assignment to work on the John Connolly Corruption Justice Task Force, for which he was awarded the FBI Director's Award for Excellence in Investigations. After he returned to Chicago, he served as the applicant coordinator before being promoted to supervisory special agent leading various programs. After retiring from the FBI, John worked health care and insurance matters in the private sector. Now, before we get to the interview, I want to remind you that I am getting closer and closer to the 300 episode milestone. I've already invited New York Times bestselling author Isabella Maldonado to be my co-host for the show in October. But in my July email to Reader Team members, I'll be asking for suggestions on what we can do to make this episode extra special. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com. There are also links to where you can join my reader team, which is all about crime fiction. There's a link where you can buy me a cup of coffee and learn more about me and my books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent John Morrison. Hey, John, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on here. In talking to you, I learned that you had this really fascinating echo terrorism case earlier in your career, and we decided to have you come on to talk about that. I think before we get deep into the case review itself, maybe you could tell us a little bit about echo terrorism and the animal liberation front that started this whole thing. Yeah, in this particular case, it's kind of funny, Jerry, that I had never worked domestic terrorism. I was in the Lansing, Michigan RA. I was originally working foreign counterintelligence out there and some criminal, but they decided that they were going to assign me terrorism cases within the RA. And funny thing is, it was the day before this attack at Michigan State University. So I'm flying blind. I have no idea what ALF is. The only thing I thought ALF was that TV show. But we got called over to Michigan State University to see this case. And then, of course, spray painted across there was ALF and we'll be back for the otters and free the minks and things like that. I was in the dark of what the Animal Liberation Front was. I had heard of Earth First, which I think is some of the cases the Bureau did early on, but nothing with regards to this. I went over there blind without any information and just started working the case. Animal Liberation Front, as I came to find out, and for most people, there is no central command structure like we would be used to and maybe some other domestic terrorism operations. Anybody can say they're without, anybody can start up a cell. I think they designed it that way so that, you know, if people do get in trouble, there isn't a large amount that you can tell or tell on people because there's no command structure. Anybody can just say, hey, we're out. 
We do a direct action, which is what they call their destruction, and it gets spray paint out for whatever you want to do. It's not like they know each other. Some of these folks have seen each other at maybe other events, but when it comes to direct actions, things are doing, they're very, very tight-lipped. You're assigned this case, and you show up and see this graffiti on the walls. What animal was it that this particular echo terrorist was trying to protect? It was mink research. Dr. Richard Allrook had been doing mink research for well over 30 some years there at Michigan State University. If people don't know with Michigan State University, it was originally an agricultural college area. It still had their own research facilities for animals. In fact, they had farms all the way around the campus, actual working farms. I know because when my kids were little, they used to have farm day and we'd get on the bus and go around all these farms. That was pretty much what they were built on. Dr. Ulrich had been doing research on these mink pretty much to find out their breeding habits and also what they were eating because a lot of the mink that were located up in northern Michigan were dying off because of their diet. He had raised a generation of minks within the lab. These minks were not wild bred and then brought in and captured. They were born and raised inside the lab, the ones that were there. That was his research, was to improve their diet, improve their population, not to do any type of experiments or anything like that. That's not what he was in it for, but he'd been doing it for many years. He and another professor there, Dr. Karen Chow, they both worked on it. Those are the type of animals. And when I showed up, the arson, the fire had been put out because it had burned Dr. Ulrich's offices, had charred them, and his research was completely destroyed in that fire. Michigan State University's investigators were already on the scene. They had contacted ATF. ATF investigator was there. I came over there. And so it began trying to figure out who did what. They also went to the mink research facility and had gone in there and released the minks that they had there. They also threw hydrochloric acid over a lot of the machinery. They had taken fire extinguishers and fired them all over the floor and then got away from there. That's pretty much where our investigation began, February 28th, 1992. I guess the significance of this is in 1992, the research was paper files. There were no computers that later on they could access to get that information. When they destroyed the farm and when they destroyed his office, they destroyed, like you said, 32 years of work. Research that was to help the me. I'll get into that a little later when I did a lot of research on their philosophy and how they did it. And for me, I think this case going over there, Jerry, represented my first time of really not knowing the subject matter and having to do my own research because the Bureau didn't have any. So I had to take it upon myself to get to know what the Animal Liberation Front was, equal terrorism. I went out and bought a book to research it. And I'll tell you how that becomes significant later on. But with this case, the one at Michigan State University was the third one for universities. Washington State and Oregon State had been hit before us. Press releases were always put out on these direct actions. We were the third one. Michigan State was kind of leading universities along with Oregon State and Washington State were doing mink research. And I think some other mink research facilities, private ones, had been hit. Bureau, even though they had cases in Seattle and Portland, they were not the lead agency in these. ATF was the lead agent. Coming in, meeting the ATF agent, This also represented, I think, the first time, Jerry, that I worked a case where it had ramifications across the country. I mean, I worked, of course, foreign counterintelligence. I worked undercover a year in foreign counterintelligence in Buffalo. It worked cases there. And then I had some criminal cases, most of bank frauds or some bank robberies. Those aren't ones you really have to delve into your subject. But this one I had to research. This is the one I really had to get to know what this was about if I thought we were going to solve it and get who was ever responsible for this. I also had to learn how to work with other federal agencies that had competing priorities within this matter. And in this regard, ATF was the lead agency. And we got the name of an ATF agent out in Portland who really knew his stuff and was investigating the one out at Oregon State, ATF agent named John Comrie. In the beginning, we decided, myself, the investigator, John McCann, was from Michigan State University, and then Mark Samir, the ATF agent, that we would put aside our competing priorities and work this case together so that we would get who we thought was responsible at the time, which was Rodney Coronado, based on what John Comrie had told us, that we would put our heads together, we would work it all together and coordinate it so that we could get this guy on a felony charge. Because I don't think at this point there had been anybody claiming to be from Al or Animal Liberation Front that had ever been convicted of a federal felony, ever. That's what we decided to do right then and there in 1992, is to do it together. 
You had mentioned that this case had national significance. What did you mean by that? National significance, two ways. One, it was probably one of the first coordinated attacks by one person across the country with regards to eco-terrorism. You have to realize this is before the Oak Bomb. You know, in Michigan, we had our share of folks that supported that. It was also nationally significant because as we proved later on, PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, were part of this attack at Michigan State University. And I'll get into that and what happened in the case a few weeks after we started. We got a call from FedEx that they had a package that their security had flagged because it was headed back to Bethesda, Maryland. And I can't remember the lady's name who it was going back to, but it was one digit off of the account number. They flagged it because FedEx at the time was getting a lot of people, a lot of the drug dealers and things like that were shipping their stuff by FedEx at that time. Their security guy flagged it and they shipped it back to Michigan State University. We went over there to Michigan State University to their detective bureau and we opened the package. And inside the package were part of Dr. Ulrich's research and a eight millimeter tape. So we played the eight millimeter tape and it was the person as it come to be Rodney Adam Coronado. It was him filming himself doing the raid. We ended up taking the application slip for the FedEx. And because ATF had a lot of the evidence, we sent it to their lab for handwriting and things like that. And also ATF at the time had the incendiary device that was used at Michigan State University. And it was the same type of incendiary device that was used in the other one. So basically with that incendiary device, here's what they do. They take a light bulb and a battery, put the light bulb on, and then they put a bunch of papers. And then at that time he had Coglin's fire paste. When the battery runs out, it lights, the bulb catches on fire, it catches the fire paste on fire, and then it lights the papers. That's how we started it. We looked at this particular tape. We couldn't see the face because Rodney had used balaclava, but we could tell whoever did it was dark skin, maybe of Hispanic, Indian, that kind of thing. You could tell by the arm that was lifted up there. Because it was going to this house, we were able to execute a search warrant there. While we were doing the search warrant, we found out and I didn't go to the search warrant. We sent the Michigan State investigator. At the time, my supervisor wasn't big on people traveling, so I never got to go and do it. We had agents from WFO, I think, that did it. To make sure everybody knows that WFO is the Washington field office, which is near headquarters in Washington, D.C., but a field office on its own. That's correct. What they found there were boxes and boxes of information from a previous raid that was being planned in New Orleans included surveillance logs, airline tickets from aliases names. Come to find out, we found information about Rondi Adam Coronado in that search warrant from a previous raid that was planned by PETA at, I think, Emory University, one of the primate centers there. But it had detailed logs. They had purchased scuba equipment. Alex Pacheco, who was the head of PETA time, there were airline tickets for him. Also, airline tickets and an alias he used. The woman who had all this stuff, she told us that PETA had, I think it was Ingrid Dukirk and some of the others had instructed her to keep that stuff at her house. They utilized her the second time to receive the information that Rodney had taken from Michigan State University. The only problem was they had planned for this, but it never made it because the account number was wrong. So we were able to get those type of things and to move from there. We started subpoenaing PETA. We had grand juries going on in three different states. PETA fought us every time for subpoenas anybody that we brought. We had a few people end up spending time in jail because they refused to participate in the subpoenas with us. And that's where we started with the case. That kind of gave us the biggest break that we had. The second biggest break we got, people talk about this, domestic terrorism organizations or other organizations like this, nobody talks or they're very tight-lipped and things like that. But we were able to get a friend of Rodney's, former girlfriend of his, got stiffed on the rent at a particular place they were living. So she gave up calling card that her boyfriend had used and Rodney had used. We were able to get that calling card to get the phone records and do a timeline of where he was, especially during the Michigan State one. And we could put him in Michigan at that time and nearby. Where was he located? Where did he live? He lived in Oregon and he had traveled there to Michigan. We also found out that there were two other women that were involved in this raid at Michigan State University. One was a local gal that lived up in the middle part of Michigan. Based on the timeline, we could put Rodney there based on the phone calls. We could also put him in D.C. afterwards, not only because of that, but also I ran an NCIC offline search of the car he was using in his license plate, and I could put it in Bethesda because he got a parking ticket there in Bethesda. 
He'd gone back to D.C. after he'd done this raid. We wanted to show that PETA was behind a lot of these direct actions. By paying the freight, we could show a history based on what we found was related to the case in New Orleans. The problem with New Orleans, and I met with the AUSA in New Orleans because we wanted to start a case there based on planning that they had done on that primate center. I ended up testifying in their grand jury down there with all of the evidence we had. They never prosecuted anybody. I think they were reluctant to take on PETA because even though there had been significant steps towards planning this raid, they had never actually done anything. So they never took the case. So that part of it went away. We kept hitting after PETA, trying to interview him, subpoenaing him to the grand jury. And in this particular case, it never done as much lab work, I think, as I had ever done before. They left us some red herrings at the scene. Like when they sprayed fire extinguisher in the research area, they purposely wore case with tennis shoes with the case with logo on the bottom just to throw us off. Outside the fence is the Meek Research Facility. They threw down pliers, wire cutters, things like that. Still had to follow up, do prints on them, do tool mark analysis on them, but nothing came out of that. With the FedEx package, we didn't get any prints on the outside. The handwriting was done and that was confirmed by ATF as being Rodney's writing because we had some of his writing beforehand. Let me ask you a question about the FedEx package. The package was returned and FedEx thought something was suspicious about it. I don't understand what was it that made you connect that FedEx package back to this incident that happened. Had they opened it and saw the stuff inside? Security people had opened up and had taken a look and saw that it belonged to this Dr. Ulrich. And I think they called Dr. Ulrich on the phone and said, hey, we've got these items here. Did you send them to somebody? He goes, no, they were stolen and my lab was destroyed. So that's why they sent it back to us. And then we ended up having that video of the raid. It showed Rodney inside the mink research facility, letting the minks go. And the sad thing is, Jerry, a lot of these minks, because they were raised in the lab, he let them go outside of the university. Probably most of them got killed, eaten. They didn't know how to hunt. You know, got run over by a car. They had never seen anything. Their philosophy was that mink were prisoners of war. And that's the one thing I had to learn in my research is that I had to learn how to think like they did, which I had never done on a lot of these cases before. I'd done some research when I was working undercover of my subjects, nothing like this. I had to know their mentality. A direct action is justified if they have released these prisoners of war and these animals were considered prisoners of war. So that's how you have to attack it. As silly as it might sound to you and I, it's not silly to them. They're dedicated to what they do. That's how they look at animals. And then Rodney had a huge history. He started at age 18 in the Sea Shepherd Society as soon as he graduated from high school. And he and another guy, David Howitt, they had gone over to Reykjavik, Iceland, snuck into the harbor there and sunk two whaling ships and bragged about it. They even did a press conference. Catch me if you can. We even tried to get Reykjavik and Iceland to prosecute him for that based on this. We were trying to hit Rodney as many ways as we possibly could. They never would go for it. I think what finally put us on the right track with doing this was John Comrie was able to find a storage locker that Rodney had. They raided that storage locker and I know they found the typewriter he used to type the press releases. We had the handwriting. And the other thing we found, which was kind of an addendum, I guess, there was an article he had saved about the theft of a U.S. cavalryman's journal from the 7th Cavalry that died at Little Bighorn. It was kind of interesting. It was kind of, I don't know why he would have that. I reached out there in Missoula, there in the RA, and talked to an agent out there, Dan Jones, and he had the case that somebody had gone into this battlefield museum, unscrewed the screws on the plexiglass that held this journal and stole it. And so I said, hey, you might want to look into Rodney Coronado. He had an article in there. So they ran prints because there was prints all over the plexiglass. Come to find out his prints were all over it. He had stolen it. And that has nothing to do no, with... Come to find out, we know why he did it, because Rodney is part Indian. And so he took that as an affront with the U.S. cavalry back then, persecuting the Indians or whatever. So we stole it. Come to find out when we talked to him, it was on a whim. He just did it on a whim, but he took it. We knew he'd done that so we could get him on that. And the difficult thing in this case, Jerry, was trying to convince the AUSA that we may never have a direct confession that Rodney did this, but we're going to have to put this case together by circumstantial evidence. We don't have a choice. I don't know if Tim Verhey was ever on board with that, but he was brand new, but he worked with us through the whole time and coordinating this with other grand juries across the United States. But we ended up interviewing the two women that were involved, Kimberly Trimue and Deborah Stout. 
we went and interviewed, tried to interview her parents about her. And this is, goes also to Peter's involvement because guess who paid for Deborah Stout's parents' attorney when we interviewed her? Peter. Correct. We really went after the woman that was receiving this stuff. And she said, hey, she was a PETA supporter. And they had asked her once before to keep all that stuff from New Orleans. So they asked her again to receive it. So PETA had asked for it. And that was their account number. Rodney had made the mistake of being one digit off, but that was their FedEx account number. So they had asked for the information back. So we knew that they were at least had either paid for this direct action or wanted the treasurer's afterwards. Now, you talked about there being a lot of circumstantial evidence. How helpful was the video of him in action? I take it he took the video as propaganda to be used in his promoting the work that they were doing as far as this economic damage that they were doing to facilities. Did it end up being helpful? It did in one regard. We couldn't see his face. We had his arm. He didn't have any scars or any marks or tattoos, so that was difficult. However, the one thing we did try, and this had never been tried before, we found a person at Michigan State University. He was an anthropologist. Norm Sauer, I think, was his name. So what we did was he was involved, of course, in digs where you find old bones and skeletons and things like that. But what he was doing was called a video superimposition. Let's say you have a skull you found at a crime scene and you have points of identification based on cheekbones or forehead or things like that. And then you take a regular picture of who you think it might be. And then you do a video wipe, like back and forth to see if those features match up. And that's the person. We tried with Rodney because we were able to get a screenshot. We went to this computer company. And of course, all this stuff is really new back in the early 90s, trying to do some of this stuff. We found a company that gave us a really good screenshot and they were able to get it down into pretty good detail. And so we got this anthropologist to put Rodney's picture up that we blew up with him wearing his mask, but we were still able to see his like eye features and forehead and things like that. And then we put the points of identification. We did that video wipe based on what we had. We put it to the grand jury, but grand jury never got it. They didn't understand it. It's too new for them. Yeah, this sounds like the early stages of facial recognition, which was used for the January 6th insurrection investigations. So that's what we did in the early 90s. We used that particular technology. It was brand new and we tried it. In his opinion, it was the same. It was him. What we did is we took another picture and we had Rodney to do that. I just don't think the grand jury understood it. Too new for that kind of thing. If I were to present it today, Jerry, it'd probably be pretty good. They'd get it. But back then in the early 90s, they didn't get it. But they did go ahead and vote, and he was indicted and charged. Exactly. He had been on the run, and he went on the run. We continued going after talking to his parents, siblings. We went and talked to everybody we could think of. I did wanted flyers for him, Interpol. And this is the one case where I'd never done any of this stuff before. I'd been working for counterintelligence. How often do you get involved in anything exciting in that? I'm having to learn all of these things, having to do those wanted posters. He never made the top 10 list, but putting stuff through Interpol, red notices. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know at all where he was. We had good evidence. We indicted him. And then, lo and behold, ATF had a source. You're talking about charges. There's an understanding today that there are no real domestic terrorism charges. And so I want to ask you what he was charged with. But I also want to talk about the economic damage. It sounds like when it comes to PETA, when it comes to Animal Liberation Front, that they believe in acts of vandalism and not violence. Even though when you have a firebombing of an office complex, I can't believe that they don't think that's violence. They think that's nonviolence. What was the dollar value, at least in 1992, of what they did at the University of Michigan's laboratories? I think they calculated it at about a quarter of a million dollars. With regards to their thinking, when I first started out, I think this doesn't make any sense. You don't call that violent or these people weren't hurting the animals. They were actually trying to do work to increase the population. But you have to turn around, as I said before, and you have to get into the mindset of the person doing it. Their conviction is that these are prisoners of war. That's how they look at them. And it's their job to free these animals, because even if you argue with them that, okay, these animals will die when you let them go because they don't know how to adapt to the wild, 
their reasoning is that better them to die outside where they're from than in a cage. You really have to put yourself as an investigator back down to that level. And that's how I determined that I had to investigate this particular guy. I had to think like he did. I sat and talked to him outside the courtroom after he pled guilty about his philosophy and things like that. That's how he explains it. It's not much different than some of the militia members after Oakmont that I interviewed and their philosophy about guns. They have certain convictions and that's what they believe in. And that's how you have to talk to them. That was the economic damage, not only for us, but Oregon State, Washington State, with the arson fires, destroying the research, taking those things away. That's what happens quite a bit. I guess you can't look at it logically. You got to look at it from their point of view. And that's kind of what it did. Very interesting. So he's out there. He's charged. ATF had a source. They said that he was living under the name Martin. I can't remember the last name. On the Indian Reservation, the Yaki Indian Reservation, which I think Rodney was part Yaki, if I'm not mistaken, on his mother's side. ATF had this source. I'm not saying anything bad about ATF, but this is the only time in all the years we worked together on this case where they tried to do an end run around the FBI. They wanted to go on the reservation. However, luckily, the supervisor out there for ATF out in Arizona basically said, you're not getting on the reservation unless the Bureau lets you. It's the only agency that's allowed to enter the reservation to do any type of investigations at all. So they reached out for the Phoenix office. They sent agents along with the ATF out there and they used a ruse to get him into the office. They basically said, hey, Martin, somebody reached out for him there and said, hey, we got this injured hawk. He saw the agents there and he took off running. And so they ran him down. He basically said, hey, I had to make him look good and run. But they caught him there. We brought him back to Michigan. We ended up giving him a polygraph, believe it or not, which he failed with regards to whether he was involved or that, because he kept maintaining his innocence. But he eventually pled guilty. And you talked about the destruction or domestic terrorism charges. They hadn't passed that law yet, Jerry, where they actually did pass a statute with regards to eco-terrorism in an act of destruction, domestic terrorism. It wasn't applicable when we had our particular crime. So we just charged him with arson. I forgot what else. He got charged with the damage, the destruction. He ended up pleading guilty to those charges because he wouldn't admit to the other ones. He said if he did it, then we had to not charge the two women that were involved, Kimberly Trimue and Deborah Louise South, which we agreed to. During the sentencing, he tried to plead that he had been doing work on the Yaki Indian Reservation, helping kids that were in gangs and things like that. And the judge that he got, Richard Enslin, who was the chief judge there in Western District of Michigan, he basically said, look, Mr. Coronado, I work with at risk you when I was in the Peace Corps. There's been problems on the reservations for years and there'll be problems when you get out of prison. So he sentenced him to 57 months in prison. I did a couple of talks later on to arson investigators and things like that. And the one thing I ended it with, there was a, actually a 60 minutes or somebody did a story on Rodney. I ended in my presentation with a picture of Rodney working out at the prison, raking rocks out in the yard. That was my way to leave the presentation and say, hey, this is where I got him. But this is the only time, the first time the Bureau had actually done that and convicted somebody. He did his time. He got out. He got in trouble again a little bit later. I think he was at a, some type of conference. He was talking about how to make bombs. I don't know if that either violated his supervised release or that he was telling people how to make bombs on the internet, that kind of thing. So he ended up going back, I think, to jail and got charged again. I think there was an agent in San Diego that charged him because she reached out for me for any background information I had on Rodney when I was still uh, working, as did a few other people. Believe it or not, this is my first and only terrorism case. Yeah, that is strange because most people, when they get into a sign, something like this, and they're successful, as you were, get known as the <laughs> expert and get pigeonholed and stuck in doing those type of investigations. Yeah, it's the only domestic terror case we had other than, you know, when Oakbaum occurred, we did a lot of work because McVeigh had been in Michigan, part of the Michigan militia, the McNichol brothers were there. So we were doing a lot of work there. This is the only one. I got calls later on about people working domestic terrorism cases, animal rights cases, because I really was the only one that had anything. We had a lot of coordinated meetings too that we met with investigators all across the country. Because we had this three-pronged approach in different states, we got together two or three times. We even got together at Quantico and had a meeting there. We brought in the investigators and talked about the case. That worked out pretty good. The guy that we had in headquarters at the time, he's since deceased, Horace Newport. He was really good, really backed us in the case, was really excited, didn't have a problem going after PETA. I think a lot of the USAs did, going after such a strong organization like that. We were willing to go after them as hard as we possibly could. We knew they were behind it. 
Was he also charged with the Washington and Oregon? No, we got rid of those if he would plead guilty to, he agreed to plead guilty to the Michigan State one if we didn't charge him with the other one. All right. I know he sent me a link to an article about this case, and I found several others, and I will put all of those in the show notes for this episode. But I also saw that he has become almost like a celebrity when it comes to echo terrorism. Oh, yeah. And that he wrote a book. Going back to the book I told you that I bought called Eco Warriors. I found it in a bookstore in Oregon. We went there for our first meeting. I haven't read Rodney's book. I never really got to know him other than talking to him outside the courtroom and stuff like that. When he sent the FedEx package, he addressed it to Leonard Robido at that address, Bethesda, Maryland. We never could figure out why he used it. I started looking through the book later on, and I found out that at Wounded Knee, when Leonard Pelletier killed the two agents, one of the other guys that was there was Bob Robido. So he used Leonard Pelletier's first name and Bob Robido's last name. Circumstantial, but it leads to the fact with the Indian part of it. Oh, absolutely. And then with the theft of the Cavalryman's Journal, that's what angered the judge the most when he sentenced him. Because he basically said, you took something on a whim that had absolutely nothing to do with your cause. Because this journal was nothing more than this guy was part of the 7th Cavalry, but he was like their supply officer. So basically he kept a diary of what the unit spent, provisions and supplies. That's all that diary was. But they found it because the guy was killed at Battle of Little Bighorn. And he stole it and he burned it. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought he just kept it. You were able to find well, it. He burned it. And he told the judge he burned it. And, that's, and that made him mad. Right. Because it's destroying a historically significant Correct. document. So he didn't get much in the way of sympathy from Judge Enslin. And he gave him 57 months. And then he had to pay back $250,000 restitution for the destruction he caused at Michigan State University. Nowadays, when we talk about eco-terrorism. I was trying to find out what's going on today because this case is almost 30 years old. It's mm -hmm. very interesting to hear how it was investigated and what happened. But I was wondering if that continues today. I don't know where we are on the animal part of it, but when it comes to eco-terrorism, I saw a lot of stuff about blow up a pipeline. And then the power stations. And the power stations. Oh, we actually had something like that here Correct. in North Carolina. Everything changes. As I told you in the beginning, anybody can say they're without. Even when we had a lot of the riots in Portland and Seattle, you know, and said, well, Antifa's behind it or Antifa's behind it. There is no central structure of Antifa. I, I liken Antifa to AOF. And you had people showing up and just spray painting out on buildings and things like that. It's difficult. Different groups form to do different things. I think, and this is not a bragging part, but this was told to us quite a bit is that we really put some damage into the animal liberation movement with this conviction because it was federal. It had a lot of years in the prison. It wasn't just like a local vandalism. We didn't look at it and treat it that way as local vandalism. We figured this was, had to have a national response based on what we had with all the other ones. And that was our mindset, as I said before, from the beginning. I told you before getting interviewed by that student at NYU, because he was trying to find out what was the Bureau's mentality back when I investigated this. I said, there really wasn't anything out there that I could rely on to go and do it. The Bureau didn't have that type of research. We didn't have the intelligence analysts that are embedded with squads. I was working in a 10-man RA. We didn't have any of that kind of stuff. So you're really on your own. Plus, you didn't have the internet. So everything you had to do, you had to read about. I tried to keep all the information I had so that later on, when I did get contacted by a few agents, I still had some of that stuff. The Bureau just didn't have that then. I don't know if they have it now and how they're investigating it. I know with that new law, you could actually charge somebody with a domestic terrorist act with regards to animals sure. or, you know, legal terrorism or things like that. Earth First, like I said before, was the one that was investigated before me. I know that they had, I forgot the guy's name, his last name was Foreman, I think. I think they caught him. They had an undercover agent in there and I think they caught him trying to transport a bomb to do something that was stopped before him. Undercover stuff with them is difficult because you really have to be vetted by somebody that knows you. I found that out. They were very closed with who they shared things with. But the one thing that was their downfall with regards to that phone card that one of Rodney's friend's girlfriends had gotten mad because he stiffed her on the bill and she talked. There was still a hierarchy of male and female. It was still a male dominated group, even in the smaller cells. 
And that used to make some of the women that were involved mad because they wanted to be involved, but it was still male dominated in what they did. And you really didn't get to be involved in any direct action unless you had been around a while. So it was difficult to put anybody under cover. You can't just show up in a beat up truck and say, gee, I want to go spray paint or release some minks or some dogs or something hard. And that's why it was so secretive. We were just happened to get some breaks in there. Regards to the FedEx package, the timeline with the phone card. When I did the offline search NCIC, I didn't know much about it, but I thought I'd give it a try. Run this plate and just having to find it and put it in there. That was the best we could do. It was all handwritten. That helped a lot, I'm sure. Like I had mentioned, I've done another case review on eco-terrorism and the animal liberation front. And that was Dana Reidenauer in episode 28. And she actually went undercover and Mm -hmm. developed these relationships so that she could infiltrate. And she did it with another agent who later became her husband. So it's a really interesting episode where you can learn how difficult it was to become a part of the group and how isolated she and her husband had to be from everything else connected to the Bureau, including becoming vegan making sure that they were wearing the right clothes and saying the right thing in order to infiltrate and to become part of the community. That was episode 28. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this. And I also put a link to information from the FBI's website on eco-terrorism today and some of the things that the Bureau is investigating because you don't hear a lot about them releasing minks or releasing animals from laboratories, hopefully showing my bias a little bit, but hopefully because a lot of that using animals for experiments, et cetera, is not happening today because, of course, we don't want that either. But we certainly don't want to fight that with any type of vandalism, which could turn to be very violent and harmful for others. And that's the thing, Rodney's philosophy and other people's philosophy is that these are all direct nonviolent actions. Like you said, they don't consider arson or destruction of property as violent. They also would talk about that they've never hurt anybody. Nobody's gotten hurt in any of the fires or things like that. And they were proud of that when they did these actions. He went out with Paul Watson and the Sea Shepherd Society, as I mentioned before, and did his damage to the whaling boats and things like that. Then he got bored with it. I think the problem is he got bored that people weren't doing enough. He always used to say, and I've seen this written down, that If you're not getting the notice of law enforcement in what you're doing, then you really need to stop and re-examine what you're doing and whether it's enough. So he didn't care. This is what his beliefs are. And that's why anybody investigating this, these type of things, you can't put your mind and what you believe in to be successful in this investigation. You have to think of like they do and what they believe in and then go from there. That's what I decided to do. And it's the first time I think in my career in a case that I'd wholeheartedly had to really research and get to know my target. Even though we wanted to all solve the case with Rodney, we did stick to the point that when we get charges, we all did it together. It wasn't one person who say, hey, we want to charge them locally. We all stuck together. We had some interesting meetings with the higher ups with regards to that, but we all stuck together what we wanted and what we wanted to do. I am glad that you were successful with this case. And obviously, the work that you did and other FBI agents and federal agents did has worked because you just don't see what happened back then 30 years ago happening today. And that's a good thing. It is. It is very much with regards to this. I think it was a big blow. And I think even PETA, even though we didn't charge anybody there, I think we were able to show the link that they were behind getting the information. And after what we found in New Orleans, those were detailed surveillance logs, flights back and forth. These surveillance logs, they were basically laying in the weeds looking and watching this place. That's their planning. That's how detailed they were. This particular case, you worked early in your career when you were assigned to the Detroit field office. At this time, I'd like to ask you my standard question, which is when and why you joined the FBI? in criminal justice in college. And then I started law enforcement as an intern at a police department. And then I contacted and talked to FBI representatives in college. I was too young and I needed more experience. And I'm like, I understand that. I started working in a police department. I was in communication center, a dispatcher. And then I left 
Illinois at that time, went to Colorado, became a police officer out there and wasn't really thinking about it. And then a couple of friends of mine decided they're going to go take the written test. And I thought, yeah, I'll give it a try. Always wanted to be in the FBI or federal. So I went and took the test. I was the only one of the group that passed the written test and then interviewed. Took me about a year to get hired and then went to Quantico in July of 1986. I loved being a police officer in the police work. I just needed a little bit more with the investigations. I always like to find out how things worked, why people did what they did. And I wanted a change. Even when I got through Quantico in November of 1986, I got assigned to the Buffalo Division. And I asked to work for counterintelligence because it was new. I'd done criminal work as a police officer. I wanted to work FCI. So threw myself into that and had a successful career there in Buffalo, worked undercover. Was also a road trip agent back when we had those. I covered both criminal and FCI stuff in the Southern tier of New York. Corning and Elmira down in that area kind of taught me to think in my own, but that's why I went in there. I just enjoyed investigative portion of it. That's why I stayed an investigator for 17 years before I ever became a supervisor. I just enjoyed it. I always wanted to have a large amount of experiences and cases worked before I became a supervisor so that if people did come to me for advice, I at least could put that experience behind me when I gave them an answer. Is there anything else during your career that you worked on that you want to mention here before we go into what you're doing now? After working that animal rights case and working with other agencies and seeing firsthand how we each had our own way of doing things, even in this case, we had large amounts of subpoenas. We split them up. It segued to me when I started working healthcare fraud cases. This is back when they were called fraud against the government cases, if you remember those, before you know, it was actual healthcare fraud. I think it led me to determine that we really needed to have a more coordinated approach to the way we did certain investigations, especially when there were agencies out there that were looking at the same thing. I started to see that some when I attended the healthcare fraud working groups in the Western District of Michigan is that I'm working cases that other agencies are working and why aren't we doing this together? When I went to Chicago, when I took my PRL to Chicago, I went to the supervisor and said, look, here's the problem I've always seen with healthcare. I think we need to have a coordinated approach maybe a task force type of approach. So she let me run with it. I put together Chicago's first healthcare fraud task force. I wrote the MOU. I got the building space and we had IRS, Bureau, HHS, Medicaid fraud controlled unit investigators and some of the Blue Cross Blue Shield to take cases and work them together, hit them from all sides. I was able to put together the healthcare fraud task force and was running it for about a year when I got called to go to Boston. I think that's what taught me to be a little bit more coordinated. I think the other thing is that Egos aside, even though we wanted to all solve the case with Rodney, we did stick to the point that when we get charges, we all did it together. It wasn't one person say, hey, we want to charge them locally. We all stuck together. We had some interesting meetings with the higher ups with regards to that, but we all stuck together what we wanted and what we wanted to do. I like the way the Bureau is approaching cases now with regards to investigations. Although I've been retired, I've been out for 14 years. When I, before I left, I personally welcomed the idea of having intelligence analysts with the squads and looking at investigations about not only what we're seeing, but how it could affect somewhere else. When I retired, I was the supervisor of the Eurasian Organized Crime Squad here in Chicago. And we did a lot of cases against nationals from China and Nigeria and things like that. Sometimes with regards to, say, like the Chinese, they were getting counterfeit driver's licenses. Who was letting them to do that? Did it affect the intelligence aspect of the Chinese? I worked against the Chinese for many years, even worked undercover against them, so I know how they fought. I like the way the Bureau's doing it. I kind of like think that I got a piece of that and started it myself in the early 90s, and it continued. I did a case review on the John Connolly case, and he was, of course, the FBI agent who was convicted of providing information that led to Whitey Bolger becoming a fugitive. And I understand that you did a lot of work on that case, too. That's correct. I was recruited by the inspector in charge of the case, Gary Bald, when I was in the Chicago division to come back to Boston to work on this investigation. It was a case I knew nothing about, really had never been to Boston or what this entailed. I told Gary that the only reason I would come is this wasn't an OPR case or this was actually a fairly good criminal case that they were looking at. He assured me there was, there'd been people working on it. I got there in May of 2000. I stayed until around November of 2001. It was a type of situation where we had to live there. I commuted back to and from Chicago every other weekend. 
back home because I was still attached to the Chicago division. I left and then came back in either January or February to start prepping for the trial. And I stayed until about April or first part of May 2002. But I had to go back to take another position within the Chicago division. It was a difficult case because we had to travel there and live there away from our homes and do work. People in that field office didn't really trust you. We were totally separate with the Justice Task Force. Well, if anybody wants to hear about the work that you did, that's episode 288 about John Connolly and the FBI Boston betrayal that he did. You've been retired for a while. What are you doing now? Actually, right now I'm not doing anything. I fully retired about three years ago, but when I left the Bureau in 2009, I became the director of investigation for a Medicare contractor doing healthcare fraud investigations. I did that for several years until we lost our contracts. And then I did it again. Back then, Medicare had what's called ZPICs, which is old program integrity contractors that do the Medicare and Medicaid investigations within a certain zone. So particular zone. We were out here in Illinois. I had all investigations for that for a couple of years. Then I just took a break for a while, went to work at Cook County Office of the Inspector General. And believe it or not, Cook County runs its own hospital system. They have Stroger Hospital. I ended up developing healthcare cases within the system. So it kind of followed me around. And then I did some internal investigations with Zurich, North American Insurance, and then got recruited back into healthcare with a company called Optum, which is part of United Health, They needed somebody to take one of their investigative units and turn them more, not as desk investigators, more field type investigator. I did that for three years, turning that investigative program around. And then 2020 came around and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to take retirement, hang out with my grandkids, travel, open myself up if anybody needed any information, consulting work, you know, on healthcare or whatever. That's pretty much all I'm doing now. We're at the very end of what I'd like to okay. do is to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? I'm glad, as I said before, that you're doing these podcasts. I don't do it to sell myself. That's not who I am. I like to share some of my investigative experiences, and especially this one. I think this was the case that defined me because I had to do so many things I'd never done before with regards to the lab and investigating this a certain way, because it really carried on to the latter part of my career and how I looked at cases between this one and of course the John Conley case. I enjoyed my career. I spent 30 years in law enforcement, got to start it from the beginning as a college intern and worked in local law enforcement that came in the bureau. When I left in 2009, it was time. I enjoyed every part. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app description of this episode, there's a direct link to the show notes where you'll find a photo of John Morrison, along with links to news articles and photos about the ALF firebombing of the Mink Research Laboratories, as well as a link to episode 28, a case review with retired agent Dana Reidenauer about animal rights extremists. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.